Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're here to give you another video on how to improve your chess game. All right, let's make the board a little bigger. That should do better. Okay, there's two factors that primarily affect how effective something is in helping you get better or affecting your game. The first factor is how often it occurs. Obviously, when you work on things that occur all the time, that has more effect than on things that rarely occur. The second factor is how much those factors affect the game. If, it's, if that factor often occurs during critical parts of the game where there's a big swing in the evaluation of the position, then those things help you more than little tiny things that, where, that occur during the game where there's a very small swing, like maybe a tenth of a pawn or something. So obviously you get the most bang for the buck when you talk about big things that occur often. For instance, let's take an example of something that occurs often. Every player has to play an opening every game. So a, a principle like move every piece once before you move any piece twice unless there's a tactic, there may be a lot of exceptions to that, but if you follow it pretty religiously, especially when you first start out, it has a big effect on your game because it affects most of the moves in your game early in the game, and it happens every single game. Same thing if you're studying tactics. If you study a tactics like double attack or pin, or removal of the guard, or even counting, which is the tactic that I always talk about, about multiple captures that can take place all over the board, then those tactics occur all the time. Those are the most common tactics. So you get the most bang for the buck when you study the most common tactics. If you study rarer tactics like interference or, or attraction, they're good, interesting uh, tactics, but they occur less often, so they have less effect on your game. So today, I, I'm always looking for things to talk about that occur fairly frequently, and I've run across this one idea that people have that they get a misconception on about recapturing or capturing with what they call the lesser piece. So I call this the mythical capture with the lesser piece principle. Let's start out by why they get the misconception. All right, so I have a bunch of things in my library here. Let's go through the examples. In the first example, we have an opening. Knight f3, d6, d4, knight d7. <clears throat> One of the main lines here of the Philidor defense. Suppose white wants to capture on e5. Well, he has two ways to capture. He can capture with a knight or he can capture with a pawn. Which way should he capture first? Well, it's not close. Because white, black is guarding e5 with a pawn and he's guarding it with a knight. If we capture first with a pawn and black takes back, let's say, with the pawn then that's an even trade. If we capture with the knight and he takes with the pawn, well, that's a losing trade. So therefore, in this kind of position where we have multiple things attacking something and he has multiple things guarding it, we want to capture with the lesser piece because when he takes back with the lesser piece, or even if he takes back with the greater piece, we're not losing anything. Okay, so in this case, that kind of principle does occur. That does hold. The question is, will it hold for every single possible type of capturing sequence where there's multiple pieces attacking and guarding squares? Let's look at some more examples of that. All right, in this case, we've got uh, a knight on f6 guarding that pawn on d5. White has this pawn attacked twice. Black only has it guarded once. Okay, white should take that pawn and win a pawn, but he has two ways to take. He can take with the queen, he can take with the knight. And of course, taking with the queen is terrible. It loses your queen. Queen takes d5, question mark. Knight takes, knight takes, and then he saves his queen. And black is winning here. So, of course, you're going to take the pawn here with the knight. Again, is this the lesser piece because there's a lesser piece guarding than the queen? And the answer is absolutely. Absolutely. All right, let's look at another example. Okay, here's a pawn. It's attacked twice. It's only guarded once. Does black have any checks he can throw in there? Well, probably not if we can guard that square. If So if white takes with the rook, black can't check and put a second piece on the rook. If black trades rooks, white will take with the queen, and white's back to even in material. And, of course, it's silly to take with the queen, even though black doesn't have this check. He'll say, thanks for the queen, 
and White is losing the end game with a queen versus a rook. So again, we see all these examples that give people the idea that, boy, you should always really be taking with the lesser piece. All right, let's keep going in examples. All right, example number four, similar to before. Okay, now I, sh I use this one as an example. Again, white can win the d5 pawn by taking both ways. He can take with the queen or he can take with the knight. If he takes either way, is he losing material? Well, in the previous examples where the guarding piece was worth less than the queen, Yes, he had to take with the lesser piece, but notice here, you could take with either piece. It, there's nothing that would tell you that taking with the lesser piece is the safer move, which means we have to use some other criterion for figuring out which piece to take with. Already we can see that the principle take with the lesser piece is probably not a good principle because when it gets to, p p to positions like this, you, there's no reason to think that taking with the lesser piece, although it's safe, would be better than taking with the greater piece here. Okay, so let's let's look at some of the pros and cons. Well, if we do it superficially, let's say we hand wave this, we could say, well, which piece is better when centralized, a knight or a queen? Well, early in the game, if you centralize your queen, it can usually be attacked by the enemy pieces. For instance, if we put our queen up on d5, at some point, maybe this knight can come up and attack the queen and make the queen move. And we don't like losing a tempo, while if we put the knight here, the best he can do is attack it with the pawn, which is also an AWL, an attack with something worth less. So it doesn't look like there might be that big a difference, but actually there's a tremendous difference. First of all, if you take with a knight, you're kind of pinning your knight to the queen, which is something you generally don't want to do. But the bigger reason not to take with the knight is that principle we talked about earlier in the video, which is move every piece once before you move any piece twice unless there's a tactic. Well, right now, white has two pieces out and black has none. If you take with the knight, you have two to none, but it's black's turn and he can bring out another piece and start to catch up. If you take with the queen, the queen hasn't moved yet, and now you have three pieces out to none, which is way better than having two pieces out to none. What else is good about taking with the queen? Well, there's a principle that's really, really, really important. Why is it important? Because it occurs all the time, and we just talked about that, and that is... When you're ahead, you want to make fair trades of pieces, not necessarily pawns. Well, when you take with the queen, you create what I call the trade or retreat issue. You're up a pawn now. The more you trade off, the better. It's sort of like you have 100 guys on the island and they only have 93. 100 to 93 is a nice edge. But if 80 guys on each side have to go home and you have 20 and they only have 13, well, that's a much bigger percentage edge than... So when you trade equal things off, it, it increases your percentage edge. It also takes away their ability to fight back because they don't have as many things to fight back with. So in chess, when you're ahead, trading queens very often takes a lot of the sharpness out of the game, which is good for the person who's ahead. So here white is saying to black, trade or retreat. But not only is he saying trade or retreat, he's attacking the rook as well. And notice there's no way for black to avoid trading queens and save the rook which means he's pretty much forced to trade queens, which would now bring the knight to the middle, and now the knight's gonna threaten the fork. Black can stop the fork with, let's say, knight a6, but then white could play something like e4, threatening bishop takes a6, followed by knight c7. And can black defend against this a little bit? Yes, but here, it turns out that for all these reasons, developing a piece, trade or retreat, when you're ahead, make fair trades of pieces, threaten the rook and make him do something. For all these reasons, let's ask the engine, which way is the better way to take? Mr. Engine, is it, uh, let's turn on Stockfish 14.1, and we'll look at the top two moves here. Okay, taking the pawn is the top two moves, and you'll probably be surprised to see here. Look at the evaluation on the two captures. Capturing with a knight indeed is winning the game. It's plus 2.69. I'm sure that'll jump around while I'm looking at it. Now it's 2.55. But capturing with the queen, the better way to capture, is plus 7.07. .07. So it's a difference of almost almost a rook difference. Well, you know, four, point, four and a half pawn difference anyway. Now it's, uh, yeah, now it's about 4.7. 
That's how much better it is to take with the queen than take it with the knight. I give this puzzle to a lot of my students, and when I say, which way would you take, the majority of my low-rated students, let's say people rated under 1,400, say take with a knight. And when I say why, some of them say, well, you should take with the lower piece. Others say it's not good to bring your queen out early. Others say that knights are good in the middle of the board like that. That's the kind of hand-waving things that they do. But all those things kind of pale against what we're actually looking at. And here, they're always shocked when they see that the difference between taking with the queen and taking with the knight is so monstrous because you're just doing all those other things that we talked about. So here, if you follow that principle, take with the lesser piece, when in fact both of them are safe, you'd be making a tremendous error by doing that. And that's why there is no principle take with the lesser piece. We could, we could change it. We could say if there's multiple valued pieces guarding it and multiple valued pieces attacking it, you know, blah, 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 blah. Then you got to start by taking with the lesser piece, assuming it's safe. Okay, if we change it and we add more definition to it so it shrinks down the possibilities that it would apply to, then maybe, yes, taking with the lesser piece in those cases apply. But if you just have a case where you can take with multiple pieces, then taking with the lesser piece is a non-existent uh, principle. It just doesn't apply. Let's see what the next example is. I think the next example is number 104. Let me pause the video. Okay, so this is a uh, takeoff on one of the previous ones where the question is, do you take with the lesser piece or do you take with the greater piece? And I think the answer here is you can't take with either piece. Remember how we were looking at the checks, captures, and threats for black? Well, clearly, if you take with the queen, not only are you losing the queen for the rook, but at the end he gets a check. And now if you take with the rook right away, he won't take rook takes rook, even though you're threatening his rook with check. He'll throw this check in first, and then no matter how you get out of check, whether it's f3 or queen f3 or move the king, it doesn't really matter. He's going to take the rook, and he'll win the rook. Queen takes. Notice here, again, we have the... You know, we could take with the greater piece or the lesser piece. Well, if you take with the lesser piece and he takes the queen, you can take his queen and he has to move the queen here. Not there, of course. Uh, but I would just do the traitor retreat, play, play queen takes here, take your queen out of the being captured, being attacked by the f3 pawn. And I would take that way. You could take either way here. I would actually take with the greater piece. All right, let's look at another example. Okay, I thought this example is a little bit amusing because here's a case where I've never had people say take with the lesser piece, um, even though sometimes it's good, which is suppose black plays bishop takes f3. Now everybody doesn't want to double their pawns. Now they want to play queen takes f3, which is, you know, we'll ask the engine, but queen takes f3 is perfectly good. Now they're, they have no qualms. No, nobody has ever quoted to me, take with the lesser piece, take with the pawn here. And I, I think I've given lots of other videos where I talk about the fact that when you take with the pawn in these kind of positions, it's usually perfectly okay. And in fact, there's a general rule in, in deep pawn games, we can look at that in a minute, about getting the queen to b3 and not worrying about that when the bishop comes out too early. But here, clearly, taking with the lesser piece is not necessary. You could just take with the queen and develop the queen. I think taking with the queen is better here. Again, let's ask the engine. Engine says, first throw in a check. All right, we'll throw in the check first. And now, how are you going to take? Engine says, take with the queen is plus two. Bishop takes d7 is equal. And if you take with the pawn, he plays a6. If uh, bishop a4 to keep the pin on, he just says knight f6. And he says, black's equal. But he says, if you take with the queen... If he now plays a6 and you play bishop a4 and now he plays knight f6, Stockfish says break open the center with e4. And look at this. We've got like a five pawn advantage. Doesn't look like it looking at the position, but we could probably play a few more moves. He's got this pawn attack three times and it's only guarded once. I'm uh, sorry, twice with the e pawn and the knight. So let's say he, uh, I don't know, let's say he pushes past. Now Stockfish says attack his knight. If he takes your knight first, you take his knight. If he takes the pawn hitting the rook, the engine says, 
play bishop takes check. And now he can't take with the queen because you take his rook with check. And if he takes with the king, you can play check here. And if he puts the bishop in the way, you can just take it check. But what else can he do if he brings the king back to e8? We play check here, and it's made on the next move. Okay, anyway, so in this kind of position, bishop takes f3, taking with the pawn, which is the lesser piece, is not usually the one that's played. Let's look at a case where you might want to do something like that. So that's another common thing that happens. So d4, d5, knight f3. Let's say black decides to bring out his bishop before he moves the pawn. Let's say he plays bishop here, and white plays c4, and now black plays, um, oh, I don't know. Let's say e6. Already Stockfish is saying white should play knight e5. Let's look at, uh, well, I don't know. Let's play one more move. Let's play e3. And let's play uh, not a wonderful move for black. Let's play uh, h6 or something silly like beginners do. Okay, look at the number one move here. The number one move here is to take the queen off of the knight. It's to play queen here. Now, you're attacking the, e -pawn, the d pawn twice, but it's guarded twice, so you're not really threatening to take on d5, but you are threatening the b7 pawn, and no matter how he guards it, it's a little awkward for him. For instance, a lot of people here like to play something like b6, and now you can see the engine is saying white's completely winning already, knight e5, threatening pawn takes followed by bishop checks, gives knight f6, pawn takes, queen takes, queen a4 check, c6, knight c3, awl hitting the queen, and black's in some big, pretty big trouble here. Um, but even even if he takes the knight, let's let's go back and let's say black plays bishop takes f3. You have time for queen takes b7 here because you're hitting the rook. But let's say you don't. Let's say you play pawn takes first, and now black plays b6 or something. See, this is the kind of position people are really worried about. They're like, wow, if I take with the pawn, which of course in this case, ironically, is the lesser piece. It was the only piece you could take once you moved the queen. They think, oh, this is terrible for white. White, white has a messed up kingside structure. Where is he going to put his king? He's in terrible danger. But if you look at the evaluation underneath, plus 2.02, .02, you know, it takes about plus 1 to be winning. And here we're plus 2.02. .02. So what we see here is, why is white winning? Well, he's winning for lots of reasons. First of all, let's count the number of black pieces off the back rank. Black has four pawns that he's moved up, and white has four pawns up, but white has the queen out already, and black has no pieces out. It's white's turn, so he's going to get some more out, plus white has the bishop pair. What's the bishop pair? It doesn't mean you have a pair of bishops. That's what people think when I test people who are new students, and I say, what's the bishop pair mean? Well, in English, it means the pair of bishops, but actually it's short for the advantage of the bishop pair, and the advantage of the bishop pair, just like if I say you have the advantage that your parents are rich. That means the other people's parents aren't rich. Your parents are rich, you have the advantage. Their parents aren't rich, not as not that advantage. Okay, that means you've got it and they don't. You've got the rich parents, they don't. Well, the advantage of the bishop pair, which we don't like to say all those syllables, so we just call it the bishop pair. The advantage of the bishop pair means you've got it, they don't. It means you've got two bishops, they don't have two bishops. It doesn't mean that you've got two bishops, because if they have two bishops and you have two bishops, nobody has the advantage of the bishop pair, and therefore nobody has, quote, the bishop pair, because it really means the advantage of the bishop pair, even though in English the bishop pair, as we said, sounds like two bishops, of course, but in chess we really mean it's the advantage of the bishop pair. Okay, so here white's got the advantage of the bishop pair, black doesn't have two bishops and white does, and that's usually worth on the average of about half a pawn. So here white has a better center, He's got better development. He's got the bishop pair, and black has weaknesses on the white squares. If we take a look at the white squares over here, they're weak, and white has a light squared bishop, and black doesn't. He's traded it off. What, what's the deficit for white? Well, white has double pawns on the f-file, and white has an isolated h-pawn. And white's king, if he castles kingside, has to be a little careful. 
But actually, in this position, White's doing quite well. Let's play a couple moves just to show you. The engine says, play knight c3 and put more pressure on this pawn. Let's say, for the sake of argument, Black tries to save it with c6. Now he says, open up the lines for the bishop. Pawn takes. Now he really doesn't want to take this way and let the bishop come in the game. So let's say he takes this way. Now the engine says, break open the middle. The, better so the side who's better developed wants to open up the game. Now he's threading this pawn three times. Let's say for the sake of argument, Black tries to guard it. Engine says, just keep developing. Bishop e3, stopping the threat of pawn takes, pawn takes, queen takes. And now Black has trouble finishing development. Let's try to finish development. We can't play Bishop d6 because of e5 with the fork. Let's say he plays Bishop e7. White says, go ahead and castle kingside if you do. I have the sneaky pin. Bishop takes h6. Black says, ooh, I, uh, what am I going to do here to get my king out? He really doesn't have any great moves. Um, they're looking at g6 as his best move, but after g6, he still can't castle because bishop takes h6. Engine says, just keep developing your pieces, bishop d3. And you can see that white's way ahead in development. He's got a better center. This evaluation, as you can see, is about plus four pawns. Okay, so this all came from the discussion way back here that are we worried about keeping the queen on the knight? Is this a lesser piece capture issue? And the answer is no. Normally you want to capture with the queen here, but here the queen's got some great things to do on b3. By attacking these weak light squares on the side of the board where the bishop got shut out. A lot of people ask me, what, you know, in the queen's gambit, why do grandmasters play e6 and block in their bishop? It gives them a bad bishop. Well, the answer is the bishop, as one grandmaster once said, bad bishops guard good pawns. And if you bring out the bishop too early, as we just saw in the line we just played here, and then block it in, whoops, sorry, with e6, then when white plays c4 and starts attacking the queen side on the light squares, it's going to be very difficult this bishop can help out once that pawn on c4 is traded. And the light squares on the queen side are going to be a good punching bag against the black pieces. Okay, so this all started with the idea of take with the lesser piece. And as I said, it's ironic here that everybody's afraid to take with the lesser piece. But here, taking with the lesser piece is sometimes okay. Let's say we don't move the queen. Let's say black plays... Um, well, it's black's turn. Let's say it just... Uh, plays knight bd7 and you play knight c3 and he plays c6 and now let's say black takes the knight bishop takes uh okay we need one more white move uh let's play bishop d3 and now black takes the knight bishop takes okay well here taking with the queen is normal and taking with the queen is better but it's not nearly as much better as most people think it is if we look at the numbers over here uh, right now, it's about 0 0.3 difference, 0 0.77 to 0 0.47. I would bet if it looks deeper, that number would actually shrink. Now it's down from 0 0.3 to 0 0.25, and back up to about 0 0.3. So I would take with the queen here, but it's not like taking with the pawn is ridiculous and ruins your game. Right now, it's got taking with the pawn at about 0 0.4 and taking with the queen at 0.7. Well, that means it's very easy to change the position a little bit to where maybe taking with the pawn would be better. Let's see what would happen if black had played, um, let's say he had played b6 early. Let's say knight f6, knight c3, b6 for some strange reason. All right, let's say uh, white now plays bishop d3, bishop takes. Would the weaknesses on the white squares throw it into taking with the pawn now? No, actually it's a slightly bigger difference. Right now it's about 0.6 difference, a little more than 0.6, but it still likes taking with the queen, but it says taking with the pawn is winning at 1.2, but taking with the queen is even better. So generally, do you want to take with the queen here? Yes. Just because you want to take with the queen though, does that mean that if you now play a move like queen to b3, that that becomes a bad move? In this case, the answer is, yeah, that's not your best move. And bishop takes f3 is okay here. So we can see some positions it makes a bigger difference, some positions a lesser difference. Here, queen b3 is not the right answer because he's already weakened himself with b6. 
So you don't need to play queen b3. You don't, you're not getting that tempo anymore. All right, so today we wanted to talk about taking with the lesser piece. There is no such principle. It's a mythical principle. I think everybody understands in a position like this that generally they want to take with the greater piece and not mess up their pawns. Are there exceptions to that? Yes, we've just seen that. And you don't always have to guard that knight with your queen. But in the general case where there's multiple pieces attacking, multiple pieces guarding, if the pieces are worth different values, then you do want to take with the lesser piece. But if not, and let's go back to the main example that I used. I think that was number 104. Let's do that. Um, well, I, I can set up the position. Pawn here, pawn here, knight here, pawn here, knight here, pawn here, pawn takes, pawn takes. Which way should white take? Should he follow the principle, take with the lesser piece? And the answer is no, it's a very big mistake here, as we saw in the earlier evaluation, to take with the lesser piece. Taking with the greater piece is the much better move. All right, I hope you enjoyed today's video. For uh, my YouTube channel, Dan Heisman Chess, please tell your friends about it. And if you like the video, say like, and otherwise you could subscribe. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.